Hello. In part one of this series, I mentioned the transformation brought about in our period by the railway. George Stevenson's rocket completed its trials at the end of 1829, and the Liverpool to Manchester railway opened the following year, and the network expanded rapidly, and along with it came new building types, including signal boxes, and of course railway stations, designed in a variety of styles, from picturesque rural stations resembling chocolate box cottages to grand city terminals with platforms spanning roofs of glass and iron, which have been described as cathedrals for the railway age. William Powell Frith captured this platform scene at Paddington Station in 1862, just eight years after the building was completed, and Frith painted himself and his family into the picture. They're in the left foreground. His first wife, Isabel, is kissing goodbye to one of their sons who is clutching a cricket bat. He's probably returning to boarding school after the spring break. An elder brother and his father are standing behind. Next to them, a bearded man argues with a cab driver and nearby are a bride and groom with two bridesmaids in attendance. Presumably the newlyweds are setting off on their honeymoon. On the right of the painting, detectives are making an arrest. St Pancras Station was completed in 1868 for the Midland Railway Company. It was designed by their chief engineer, William Henry Barlow, with a single span roof. Among the goods transported to London by the Midland Railway were large quantities of beer from Burton-on-Trent, which was then the brewing capital of the world. Often there were three trains a day, sometimes more, and the architecture of St Pancras is designed around the trade. Cast iron columns were spaced specifically to accommodate beer barrels and some of these can be seen in what is now Eurostar's International Check-in and Departure Lounge, which once served as a barrel store. Leicester's spacious London Road station was also built for the Midland Railway. It opened in 1894. Designed in red brick and terracotta by the architect Charles Trubshaw, the frontage onto London Road has changed little. It still looks much as it did when it was built. Large arched entrances, two for arrivals and two for departures. There's a classical style parapet with urns and a hand wound clock in a domed tower. Many small country stations closed in the 1960s. Some, not all, have been repurposed. Others have been lost. Alton Station in Staffordshire operated from 1849 until 1965. It has been attributed to Augustus Pugin, who worked on several commissions for the Earl of Shrewsbury, who lived at nearby Alton Towers, and who was the prime mover behind the station. If it wasn't Pugin, the most likely candidate is Henry Arthur Hunt. The station was originally much larger. What remains is the waiting room, in rusticated stone with a hipped pantile roof, round-headed windows and fan lights, and the station manager's house, built in the style of an Italianate villa. Three storeys in stone, again with a pantile roof and a balcony on the middle floor. This is now in the care of the Landmark Trust and available as a holiday rental. The waiting room at Cromford Station in Derbyshire, designed around 1860 by George Stokes. He was the son-in-law of Joseph Paxton, who we met in part five of this series. And George Stokes had worked in France and here he used that experience to create a chateau style building incorporating a cat slide roof, diamond pane windows and a clock beneath a slender pyramid turret. Restored in 2009, it's now a holiday cottage. 
Millbrook station in Bedfordshire is still a working station, though like many it's no longer staffed. It opened in 1846 and the picturesque cottage style was typical of the Bedford Railway. The half timbered look is ornamental, it's not structural. The timbers are applied over brick and rough cast. The roof with its steep gables still has some of its original scalloped clay tiles alongside replacements. In Frank Brangwyn's 1913 etching of Cannon Street Station, the platform is as crowded as Frith scene at Paddington, but Brangwyn's image is less imaginative, much closer to a real scene. Waiting for a train are families from the East End of London, off to spend a late summer working holiday, hot picking in the Kent countryside. From the 1870s, hot picker special trains were laid on by the companies involved. Before mechanisation in the 1950s, harvesting hops for the brewing industry was a very labour intensive business. At its peak, close to 40,000 pickers were involved and families were provided with basic accommodation. In part eight, I looked at Letchworth in Hertfordshire, Britain's first garden city. With no provision for industry at Letchworth, it soon became one of the first commuter towns and this scene was captured by Spencer Gore in 1912, a year he spent living in Letchworth. Now next time I'm going to take a look at the architectural impact of Art Nouveau. If you've enjoyed this video hit the like and subscribe buttons and click on the notification bell to be informed when the next video is available or you can subscribe by clicking on the rose window over my shoulder.